Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. The hit cast offers a weekly look at Hollywood from a conservative point of view. Sick of media bias infecting Hollywood headlines? Tired of stars insulting your views? Hit has your back. Now, here's your host, Christian Toto. Welcome to the show. If this is your first time listening, well, thanks for coming. The Hollywood and Toto podcast is every Friday with engaging interviews, the latest headlines, and recommendations to make the most of your leisure time. As always, you can find the show notes at hollywoodintoto.com. This week we're talking with Andrew Clavin, simply one of the best novelists around. But before we get to Andrew, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fallout from an article I wrote recently that appeared at the National Review Online. I argue that the majority of entertainment journalists are liberal and that it impacts their work. It's undeniable, and I pointed out just kind of a tiny fraction of evidence. Cobbled over an hour or two, I could have gone much, much further, but I kind of just stopped there and said, hey, here's the sample, make up your own mind. Now, I happened to follow some entertainment journalists online, and they didn't take too kindly to it. Actually, one one particular person cursed me out, which I thought was pretty classy, and said I was confusing reporting with criticism, even though I actually had examples of both. But here's where he's wrong. Your local paper is mostly news, with a smattering of opinion on the op-ed pages kind of toward the back. Entertainment sites, they're different. There's a lot more opinion kind of rotated into the content. It's not just in the back pages. It's, it's Frankly, it's all over. It's in the reviews. It's in the commentary. It's in the predictions. And frankly, this time of year, it's in all those top 10 lists, the best, the worst, chock full of opinion and chock full of liberal bias. Now, that's okay if you're working for the nation or maybe some other decidedly left-leaning or even right-leaning side. I think you should embrace your ideology in that regard. I am a conservative movie critic and entertainment journalist. I'm upfront about it, and Hollywood and Toto is a right-leaning site. No one is confused when they come to the site. Other people, well, if you're working for Deadline or The Hollywood Reporter or Variety, that's meant to be, I would assume, a, a mainstream site that doesn't cater to one particular side. It's meant for the red states and the blue states, but it's not always that way. Now, I've been covering Hollywood for some time, and the bias against conservatives is pretty palpable, and against the GOP as well. And, you know, when you look at articles that say, hey, that Jon Stewart, well, he's a hero to us. Well, you know what? He's not a hero to all of us. He's actually a hero to liberals because he reflected their worldview, and that's perfectly fine. But I recently saw an article that was in one of the major entertainment sites and it said just that. It was a perfect example of the bias that seeps into so much commentary when it comes to Hollywood. And as I often joke, you could stick all the conservative entertainment reporters in a in a car and have plenty of room left over, frankly. We've spoken already with Kyle Smith from the New York Post, John Nolte from the Daily Wire. There's just a handful of us. And why is that? You know, it's just a weird situation. It's the bias that we see across the regular news sites. And it happens in entertainment press as well. So just want to kind of point out that article and frankly, fire back a little bit. It's those who are sort of cursing me out on social media. Not cool. And frankly, I think that the thin skins they're showing is indicative of the thin skins that the mainstream press has when it comes to news coverage and their biases as well. Pretty darn clear. Now, before we get to the interview, I wanted to share my hit tip of the week. It's go watch Shit's Creek now. And apologize for the language, but that is the name of the show. It's created by Eugene Levy and his son, Dan Levy, and it stars Levy and Howhara and his son as an affluent family stripped entirely of their wealth. The suddenly poor clan has to live in a dive motel, all four of them. You've got the two grown kids and mama and dada. And let me tell you, it is not exactly a uh, fountain of warmth and maternal spirits. It is every man or woman for himself. And that's kind of part of the fun. You know, it's very hard to make a show like this and have these vain characters stripped of all their possessions, make them lovable. But this show does it. But it's not just about them. It's about the humor. And I have to say, Levy and O'Hara in particular, basically running a master's class in comedy. Their reactions, the way they deliver lines, the way they interact with each other, it's just darn perfect. And even when the show isn't laugh-out-loud funny, it's always engaging, always enjoyable. And I really have found this to be a great discovery. Now, the first two seasons of Schitt's Creek are available on Amazon Prime. Season three is starting up very soon on select cable channels. It depends on what you're getting in your neighborhood. It's actually from a Canadian channel, so that's the home of origin. But I know that uh, some Comcast outlets are having it via the Pop channel. So check out where you are. Check out what services you have and if you're able to see the new episodes. But 
If not, at least catch up on the old, see, old first two seasons. They are worth the wait. Trust me. Now, let's go to our feature we interview with Andrew Claven. Andrew is the mind behind mystery thrillers like True Crime and Don't Say a Word, both of which became feature films. His young adult novels like the Homelander series just trying to show off how versatile and intelligent he really is. His latest book, The Great Good Thing, is a deeply personal account of how he left his family's Jewish roots behind for Christianity. You know, not many authors get as honest about their life, about their flaws, and about their family as he does, and it's a quite a good read. And if that were enough, he also hosts a really great podcast over the Daily Wire. So here's my chat with Andrew Claven. Well, I, you know, I want to start with The Great Good Thing, and... and you know, obviously, as a writer, as an op-ed uh, columnist, you share a lot about yourself. But this particular book has passages that were really kind of digging deep into your family and your history and, and just, uh, I guess, a side of you that people probably didn't know. It, was it was it kind of hard to go that deep and to reveal those those sides of you? Or is it just, did you think, hey, I've got to do this, I've got to do this all the way? I, I, it was kind of that. I thought if I'm going to do this, I've right, really got to go for uh, I am kind of a private person. I don't really uh, talk a lot about my personal life uh, in public, but this, this was the story. This was the story I had to tell, and it seems an important story to tell because I'm talking about a guy, myself, who made the journey to faith while surrounded by an atmosphere of uh, a default atheism, a default non-belief, uh, you know, working in Hollywood, working in New York, working in industries and around and living around people basically thought that if you had faith, you were kind of a rube, and especially if you had Christian faith, you must be some kind of sinister rube. It, it wasn't all that easy to find my way to the logic of faith and the fact that it explained, every, you know, it really explained the, the world much better than, um, than disbelief. So I thought it, the story was worth telling for that reason. I thought if I was going to tell it, I really had to tell it. The, the real difficulty was not was while exposing myself, not exposing anybody else. Mm -hmm. Because I have family members and friends and all that. It, it's not their choice to have their lives exposed. So I had to dance around that. And I say in the book that I'm dancing around it a little bit. But other than that, when it came to me, I wanted to be bluntly honest. Gotcha. You know, one of the things I found so intriguing about the book is how you use popular culture to kind of tell your story and how it kind of... I guess interwove with, with what your faith journey was. Can you talk a little bit for the people who haven't read the book yet? Maybe just kind of explore that a bit because I was fascinated by that approach. Well, one of the things that happened to me, you know, was I wanted to be a writer from a pretty young age. I mean, at least uh, by the age of 13 or 14, I was pretty certain that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a novelist. And, and so in my do in a dogged way, typical of myself, I began to try and read as much of the literature that I loved as I could, and as I did, I, it started to dawn on me that all of this literature had a Christian underpinning. I, you know, it was the tough guy writers that I really loved, Ernest Hemingway and Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett, and of course all of those books relate to the search for the Holy Grail and, uh, you know, Christian ideas of knighthood and all this, which led me in turn to the Knights of uh, the Round Table, which has a lot of Christian imagery. So here I was, a, a Jewish guy in a pretty secular household. I mean, we learned a lot of Jewish tradition, but we, there was no faith in God in my house. And I thought, like, gee, I don't really know anything about this tradition. Here, here it is underlying all these books that I love. Mm -hmm. even, and even popular things that I was seeing, like I remember uh, seeing The Great White Hope on stage when I was a kid. And I remember at the end, the fighter comes out with his arms spread wide in this Christ-like attitude. And I'm thinking, gee, I, I really don't know about this. So I had to go out and buy a New Testament because we didn't have one in my house. And I started to read it purely as an educational exercise, as an exercise of becoming a better writer. And I tell the story in the book about how my father walked in on me while I was reading the gospel according to St. Luke and hit the roof, which, you know, because he was furious that I would allow the Christian enemy into our house. And I always laugh at the story because, of course, if you walk in on your teenage <laughs> you know, you're going to find reading a lot worse stuff than the gospel according to St. Luke. But I think he would have been fine with that. <laughs> But I was reading the gospel just drove him mad. <laughs> One of the recurring themes in all of your work, and including this particular book, was the fact that even though you are a person of faith, you don't shy away from the gritty nature of storytelling. You, you know, you may have gore, you may have violence, you may have sexuality, and I'm always, I'm always appreciative of the fact that you're, 
your perspective on the arts isn't that it has to be G-rated, that, that, that life and faith is more complicated than that. Can you talk about was, – was, has that – becoming more faithful, did that ever change or did it sort of evolve with your way of thinking at all? Uh, you know, it really hasn't. I, I'm a little bit more sensitive to the fact that some people in the audience – you know, one of the things is when you're from New York – you talk a little rougher than other people. <laughs> uh, you know, this is this is very clear with Donald Trump. You know, a lot of the things that Trump says that shock people don't shock me because I'm from New York. I've, I've heard this all my life. But but it's also true that that God is God of the real world. He's not God of Candyland. You know, that God is is God of the world of tragedy, of war, of monsters, of sex, of lust. A world that, by the way, I find enormously entertaining and and interesting and fascinating. If it really depends on what you think art is about. I think art is a record of the internal experience of being a human being. And to me, that means realism. You have to discuss the real things that go on in people's minds, the squirrely little lusts that we all have, the, the squirrely, selfish, mean thoughts we all have, the sick, perverse thoughts we all have. And, and that means that your hero has, not just that your villain has. And if you're not discussing that, you're not discussing the real world, and if you're discussing a God who's not God of the real world, what are you talking about? How can you reach anybody? You can only reach those people who want to hear their their beliefs confirmed, their happy talk that echoed back at them. And, and listen, I'm not against that. I'm not against, just the same way I'm not against romantic comedies. I don't like romantic comedies, but I understand that girls have daydreams and these those movies and books speak into those daydreams. I'm not against Christian, you know, polite Christian films, I understand they speak into you know, religious people's daydreams. I'm just not interested in reading them or writing them. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm much more interested in trying to represent what it's like to be a human being in this world in trust, in trust that God will speak through that because he is the God of this world, not the made up world. The, the book has been out a few weeks now. What's been, what have you learned about the reaction to the to the book. I mean, obviously, there's some people going to applaud your journey. Other people may not be as enthusiastic. But what what's what's the takeaway from you as someone who's written this and left yourself open? What do you kind of walk away with? It's astounding. It has genuinely been, been astounding. I've gotten some. I expected some pushback. You know, the, the subtitle of the book it's called The Great Good Thing, but the subtitle is a, a secular Jew comes to faith in Christ. And there are many Jews who find that offensive per se. You know, in and of itself, they find that offensive. So I've gotten some pushback from that, uh, from Jewish people who say, no, this is wrong, you know, you shouldn't abandon your people and all this. And I read an entire chapter about that concept uh, in the book. But aside from that, the, it's been the most, I would say, the most remarkable experience of, of my writing life. The people who are writing in and saying, this is my story, and this has really helped me to re-examine faith and the possibility that shocks me so much is my story is not a universal story. It's a story of a, a guy in a very specific milieu, the, the kind of uh, upper middle class Jewish milieu outside of New York. And yet the people writing to me are Irish and Italian and uh, from overseas and all that saying, yes, this really does echo my story. And it's incredibly moving to me, especially when people say that I've helped them uh, move them on their journey because I really do feel that people are surrounded by this atmosphere of non-belief. It seeps in even into our language when we say things like, I felt an adrenaline rush as if we were just a bag of chemicals. You know? <laughs> I felt a dopamine high. We're not just a bag of chemicals. Those chemicals actually represent something spiritual and, and invisible that only comes into the world through, through matter. And I just think that atmosphere is, is so rarely broken through <laughs> by somebody who has been a non-believer and can speak that language. It's too often broken through by people who are preaching at you, who are saying, Jesus, 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 you know, something that's very uncomfortable for non-believers to hear, and, and something that would never have convinced me or brought me to faith. Uh -huh. And so I've been really uh, gratified by that reaction. Gotcha. Now, you also have a podcast of your own at The Daily Wire, and I was kind of curious, you know, I'm just starting my podcasting journey now, but you've been at it a while. What's... Does it change the way you look at headlines, the way you kind of break down the culture? Does it – I mean you, you have been observing this for a long time and you write and write and write.